12th degree. Grand Master Architect. Comma Master Architect, the great duties that are inculcated by the lessons taught by the work in instruments of a Grand Master Architect, demanding so much of us, and taking for granted the capacity to perform them faithfully and fully, bring us at once to reflect upon the dignity of human nature, and the vast powers and capacities of the human soul, and to that theme we invite your attention in this degree. Let us begin to rise from earth toward the stars. Of more the human soul struggles toward the light, toward God, and the infinite. It is especially so in its afflictions. Words go but a little way into the depths of sorrow. The thoughts that try there in silence, that go into the stillness of infinitude and eternity, have no emblems. Thoughts enough come there, such as no tongue ever uttered. They do not so much want human sympathy, as higher help. There is a loneliness in deep sorrow which the Deity alone can relieve. Alone, the mind wrestles with the great problem of calamity, and seeks the solution from the infinite providence of heaven, and thus is led directly to God. There are many things in us of which we are not distinctly conscious. To waken that slumbering consciousness into life, and so to lead the soul up to the light, is one office of every great ministration to human nature, whether its vehicle be the pen, the pencil, or the tongue. We are unconscious of the intensity and awfulness of the life within us. Health and sickness, joy and sorrow, success and disappointment, life and death, love and loss, are familiar words upon our lips, and we do not know to what depths they point within us. We seem never to know what anything means or is worth until we have lost it. Many an organ, nerve, and fiber in our bodily frame performs its silent part for years, and we are quite unconscious of its value. It is not until it is injured that we discover that value, and find how essential it was to our happiness and comfort. We never know the full significance of the words property, ease, and, health, the wealth of meaning in the fond epithets, parent, child, beloved, and, friend, until the thing or the person is taken away, until, in place of the bright, visible being, comes the awful and desolate shadow, where nothing is, where we stretch out our hands in vain, and strain our eyes upon dark and dismal vacuity. Yet, in that vacuity, we do not lose the object that we loved. It becomes only the more real to us. Our blessings not only brighten when they depart, but are fixed in enduring reality, and love and friendship receive their everlasting seal under the cold impress of death. A dim consciousness of infinite mystery and grandeur lies beneath all the commonplace of life. There is an awfulness and a majesty around us, in all our little worldliness. The rude peasant from the Apennines, asleep at the foot of a pillar in a majestic Roman church, seems not to hear or see, but to dream only of the herd he feeds or the ground he tills in the mountains. But the choral symphonies fall softly upon his ear, and the gilded arches are dimly seen through his half-slumbering eyelids. So the soul, however given up to the occupations of daily life, cannot quite lose the sense of where it is, and of what is above it and around it. The scene of its actual engagements may be small, the path of its steps, beaten and familiar the objects it handles, easily spanned, and quite worn out with daily uses. So it may be, and amidst such things that we all live. So we live our little life, but heaven is above us and all around and close to us, and eternity is before us and behind us, and suns and stars are silent witnesses and watches over us. We are enfolded by infinity. Infinite powers and infinite spaces lie all around us. The dread arch of mystery spreads over us, and no voice ever pierced it. Eternity is enthroned amid heaven's myriad starry heights, and no utterance or word ever came from those far-off and silent spaces. Above, is that awful majesty, around us, everywhere, it stretches off into infinity, and beneath it is this little struggle of life, this poor day's conflict, this busy ant hill of time. But from that ant hill, not only the talk of the streets, the sounds of music and reveling, the stir and tread of a multitude, the shout of joy and the shriek of agony go up into the silent and all-surrounding infinitude, but also, 
amidst the stir and noise of visible life, from the inmost bosom of the visible man, there goes up an imploring call, a beseeching cry, an asking, unuttered, and unutterable, for revelation, wailingly and in almost speechless agony praying the dread arch of mystery to break, and the stars that roll above the waves of mortal trouble, to speak, the enthroned majesty of those awful heights to find a voice, the mysterious and reserved heavens to come near, and all to tell us what they alone know, to give us information of the loved and lost, to make known to us what we are, and whither we are going. Man is encompassed with a dome of incomprehensible wonders. In him and about him is that which should fill his life with majesty and sacredness. Something of sublimity and sanctity has thus flashed down from heaven into the heart of every one that lives. There is no being so base and abandoned but hath some traits of that sacredness left upon him, something, so much perhaps in discordance with his general repute, that he hides it from all around him, some sanctuary in his soul, where no one may enter, some sacred enclosure, where the memory of a child is, or the image of a venerated parent, or the remembrance of a pure love, or the echo of some word of kindness once spoken to him an echo that will never die away. Life is no negative, or superficial or worldly existence. Our steps are ever more haunted with thoughts, far beyond their own range, which some have regarded as the reminiscences of a pre-existent state. So it is with us all, in the beaten and worn track of this worldly pilgrimage. There is more here, than the world we live in. It is not all of life to live. An unseen and infinite presence is here, a sense of something greater than we possess, a seeking, through all the void wastes of life, for a good beyond it, a crying out of the heart for interpretation, a memory of the dead, touching continually some vibrating thread in this great tissue of mystery. We all not only have better intimations, but are capable of better things than we know. The pressure of some great emergency would develop in us powers, beyond the worldly bias of our spirits, and heaven so deals with us, from time to time, as to call forth those better things. There is hardly a family in the world go selfish, but that, if one in it were doomed to die, one, to be selected by the others, it would be utterly impossible for its members, parents and children, to choose out that victim, but that each would say, I will die, but I cannot choose. And in how many? if the dire extremity had come, would not one and another step forth, freed from the vile meshes of ordinary selfishness, and say, like the Roman father and son, let the blow fall on me, there are greater and better things in us all, than the world takes account of all, or than we take note of all, if we would but find them out. And it is one part of our Masonic culture to find these traits of power and sublime devotion to revive these faded impressions of generosity and self-sacrifice, the almost squandered bequests of God's love and kindness to our souls, and to induce us to yield ourselves to their guidance and control. Upon all conditions of men presses down one impartial law. To all situations, to all fortunes, high or low, the mind gives their character. They are, in effect, not what they are in themselves but what they are to the feeling of their possessors. The king may be mean, degraded, miserable, the slave of ambition, fear, voluptuousness, and every low passion. The peasant may be the real monarch, the moral master of his fate, a free and lofty being, more than a prince in happiness, more than a king in honor. Man is no bubble upon the sea of his fortunes, helpless and irresponsible upon the tide of events. Out of the same circumstances, different men bring totally different results. The same difficulty, distress, poverty, or misfortune, that breaks down one man, builds up another and makes him strong. It is the very attribute and glory of man, that he can bend the circumstances of his condition to the intellectual and moral purposes of his nature, and it is the power and mastery of his will that chiefly distinguish him from the brute. The faculty of moral will, developed in the child, is a new element of his nature. It is a new power brought upon the scene, and a ruling power, delegated from heaven. Never was a human being sunk so low that he had not, by God's gift, the power to rise, 
because God commands him to rise, it is certain that he can rise. Every man has the power, and should use it, to make all situations, trials, and temptations instruments to promote his virtue and happiness, and is so far from being the creature of circumstances, that he creates and controls them, making them to be all that they are, of evil or of good, to him as a moral being. Life is what we make it, and the world's is what we make it. The eyes of the cheerful and of the melancholy man are fixed upon the same creation, but very different are the aspects which it bears to them. To the one, it is all beauty and gladness. The waves of ocean roll in light, and the mountains are covered with day. Life, to him, flashes, rejoicing, upon every flower and every tree that trembles in the breeze. There is more to him, everywhere, than the eye sees, a presence of profound joy on hill and valley, and bright, dancing water. The other idly or mournfully gazes at the same scene, and everything wears a dull, dim, and sickly aspect. The murmuring of the brooks is a discord to him, the great roar of the sea has an angry and threatening emphasis. The solemn music of the pines sings the requiem of his departed happiness. The cheerful light shines garishly upon his eyes and offends him. The great train of the seasons passes before him like a funeral procession, and he sighs, and turns impatiently away. The eye makes that which it looks upon. The ear makes its own melodies and discords. The world without reflects the world within. Let the mason never forget that life and the world are what we make them by our social character, by our adaptation, or want of adaptation to the social conditions, relationships, and pursuits of the world. To the selfish, the cold, and the insensible, to the haughty and presuming, to the proud, who demand more than they are likely to receive, to the jealous, ever afraid they shall not receive enough, to those who are unreasonably sensitive about the good or ill opinions of others, to all violators of the social laws, the rude, the violent, the dishonest, and the sensual, to all these, the social condition, from its very nature, will present annoyances, disappointments, and pains, appropriate to their several characters. The benevolent affections will not revolve around selfishness, the cold-hearted must expect to meet coldness, the proud, haughtiness, the passionate, anger, and the violent, rudeness. Those who forget the rights of others, must not be surprised if their own are forgotten, and those who stoop to the lowest embraces of sense must not wonder, if others are not concerned to find their prostrate honor, and lift it up to the remembrance and respect of the world. To the gentle, many will be gentle, to the kind, many will be kind. A good man will find that there is goodness in the world, an honest man will find that there is honesty in the world, and a man of principle will find principle and integrity in the minds of others. There are no blessings which the mind may not convert into the bitterest of evils, and no trials which it may not transform into the noblest and divinest blessings. There are no temptations from which assailed virtue may not gain strength, instead of falling before them, vanquished and subdued. It is true that temptations have a great power, and virtue often falls, but the might of these temptations lies not in themselves, but in the feebleness of our own virtue, and the weakness of our own hearts. We rely too much on the strength of our ramparts and bastions, and allow the enemy to make his approaches by trench and parallel, at his leisure. The offer of dishonest gain and guilty pleasure makes the honest man more honest, and the pure man more pure. They raise his virtue to the height of towering indignation. The fair occasion, the safe opportunity, the tempting chance become the defeat and disgrace of the tempter. The honest and upright man does not wait until temptation has made its approaches and mounted its batteries on the last parallel but to the impure, the dishonest, the false-hearted, the corrupt, and the sensual, occasions come every day, and in every scene, and through every avenue of thought and imagination. He is prepared to capitulate before the first approach is commenced, and sends out the white flag when the enemy's advance comes in sight of his walls. He makes occasions, or, if opportunities come not, evil thoughts come and he throws wide open the gates of his heart and welcomes those bad visitors, 
and entertains them with a lavish hospitality. The business of the world absorbs, corrupts, and degrades one mind, while in another it feeds and nurses the noblest independence, integrity, and generosity. Pleasure is a poison to some, and a healthful refreshment to others. To one, the world is a great harmony, like a noble strain of music with infinite modulations, to another, it is a huge factory, the clash and clang of whose machinery jars upon his ears and frets him to madness. Life is substantially the same thing to all who partake of its lot. Yet some rise to virtue and glory, while others, undergoing the same discipline, and enjoying the same privileges, sink to shame and perdition. Thorough, faithful, and honest endeavor to improve, is always successful, and the highest happiness. To sigh sentimentally over human misfortune, is fit only for the mind's childhood, and the mind's misery is chiefly its own fault, appointed, under the good providence of God, as the punisher and corrector of its fault. In the long run, the mind will be happy just in proportion to its fidelity and wisdom. When it is miserable, it has planted the thorns in its own path, it grasps them, and cries out in loud complaint. And that complaint is but the louder confession that the thorns which grew there, it planted. A certain kind and degree of spirituality enter into the largest part of even the most ordinary life. You can carry on no business, without some faith in man. You cannot even dig in the ground without a reliance on the unseen result. You cannot think or reason or even step, without confiding in the inward, spiritual principles of your nature. All the affections and bonds, and hopes and interests of life center in the spiritual, and you know that if that central bond were broken, the world would rush to chaos. Believe that there is a God, that He is our Father, that He has a paternal interest in our welfare and improvement, that He has given us powers, by means of which we may escape from sin and ruin, that he has destined us to a future life of endless progress toward perfection and a knowledge of himself, believe this, as every mason should, and you can live calmly, endure patiently, labor resolutely, deny yourselves cheerfully, hope steadfastly, and be conquerors in the great struggle of life. Take away any one of these principles, and what remains for us? Say that there is no God or no way opened for hope and reformation and triumph, no heaven to come, no rest for the weary, no home in the bosom of God for the afflicted and disconsolate soul, or that God is but an ugly blind chance that stabs in the dark, or a somewhat that is, when attempted to be defined, a no-hat, emotionless, passionless, the supreme apathy to which all things, good and evil, are alike indifferent or a jealous God who revengefully visits the sins of the fathers on the children, and when the fathers have eaten sour grapes, sets the children's teeth on edge, an arbitrary supreme will, that has made it right to be virtuous, and wrong to lie and steal, because it pleased to make it so rather than otherwise, retaining the power to reverse the law, or a fickle, vacillating, inconstant deity, or a cruel, bloodthirsty, savage Hebrew or Puritanic one and we are but the sport of chance and the victims of despair, hapless wanderers upon the face of a desolate, forsaken, or accursed and hated earth, surrounded by darkness, struggling with obstacles, toiling for barren results and empty purposes, distracted with doubts, and misled by false gleams of light, wanderers with no way, no prospect, no home, doomed and deserted mariners on a dark and stormy sea, without compass or course to whom no stars appear, tossing helmless upon the weltering, angry waves, with no blessed haven in the distance whose guiding star invites us to its welcome rest. The religious faith thus taught by masonry is indispensable to the attainment of the great ends of life, and must therefore have been designed to be a part of it. We are made for this faith, and there must be something, somewhere, for us to believe in. We cannot grow healthfully, nor live happily without it. It is therefore true. If we could cut off from any soul all the principles taught by masonry, the faith in a God, in immortality, in virtue, in essential rectitude, that soul would sink into sin, misery, darkness, and ruin. If we could cut off all sense of these truths, 
the man would sink at once to the grade of the animal. No man can suffer and be patient, can struggle and conquer, can improve and be happy, otherwise than as the swine are, without conscience, without hope, without a reliance on just, wise, and beneficent God. We must, of necessity, embrace the great truths taught by masonry, and live by them, to live happily. I put my trust in God, is the protest of masonry against the belief in a cruel, angry, and revengeful God, to be feared and not reverenced by his creatures. Society, in its great relations, is as much the creation of heaven as is the system of the universe. If that bond of gravitation that holds all the worlds in systems together, were suddenly severed, the universe would fly into wild and boundless chaos. And if we were to sever all the moral bonds that hold society together, if we could cut off from it every conviction of truth and integrity, of an authority above it, and of a conscience within it, it would immediately rush to disorder and frightful anarchy and ruin. The religion we teach is therefore as really a principle of things, and as certain and true, as gravitation. Faith in moral principles, in virtue, and in God, is as necessary for the guidance of a man, as instinct is for the guidance of an animal. And therefore this faith, as a principle of man's nature, has a mission as truly authentic in God's providence, as the principle of instinct. The pleasures of the soul, too, must depend on certain principles. They must recognize a soul, its properties and responsibilities, a conscience, and the sense of an authority above us, and these are the principles of faith. No man can suffer and be patient, can struggle and conquer, can improve and be happy, without conscience, without hope, without a reliance on just, wise, and beneficent God. We must of necessity embrace the great truths taught by masonry, and live by them, to live happily. Everything in the universe has fixed and certain laws and principles for its action semicolon the star in its orbit, the animal in its activity, the physical man in his functions. And he has likewise fixed and certain laws and principles as a spiritual being. His soul does not die for want of aliment or guidance. For the rational soul there is ample provision. From the lofty pine, rocked in the darkening tempest, the cry of the young raven is heard, and it would be most strange if there were no answer for the cry and call of the soul, tortured by want and sorrow and agony. The total rejection of all moral and religious belief would strike out a principle from human nature, as essential to it as gravitation to the stars, instinct to animal life, the circulation of the blood to the human body. God has ordained that life shall be a social state. We are members of a civil community. The life of that community depends upon its moral condition. Public spirit, intelligence, uprightness, temperance, kindness, domestic purity, will make it a happy community, and give it prosperity and continuance. Widespread selfishness, dishonesty, intemperance, libertinism, corruption, and crime, will make it miserable, and bring about dissolution and speedy ruin. A whole people lives one life, one mighty heart heaves in its bosom, it is one great pulse of existence that throbs there. One stream of life flows there, with ten thousand intermingled branches and channels, through all the homes of human love. One sound as of many waters, a rapturous jubilee or a mournful sighing, comes up from the congregated dwellings of a whole nation. The public is no vague abstraction nor should that which is done against that public, against public interest, law, or virtue, press but lightly on the conscience. It is but a vast expansion of individual life, an ocean of tears, an atmosphere of sighs, or a great hole of joy and gladness. It suffers with the suffering of millions, it rejoices with the joy of millions. What a vast crime does he commit, private man or public man, agent or contractor, legislator or magistrate, secretary or president, comma, who dares, with indignity and wrong, to strike the bosom of the public welfare, to encourage venality and corruption, and shameful sale of the elective franchise, or of office, to sow dissension, and to weaken the bonds of amity that bind a nation together. What a huge iniquity! He who, with vices like the daggers of a parricide, 
dares to pierce that mighty heart, in which the ocean of existence is flowing. What an unequalled interest lies in the virtue of everyone whom we love. In his virtue, nowhere but in his virtue, is garnered up the incomparable treasure. What care we for brother or friend, compared with what we care for his honor, his fidelity, his reputation, his kindness? How venerable is the rectitude of a parent! How sacred his reputation! No blight that can fall upon a child, is like a parent's dishonor. Even or Christian, every parent would have his child do well, and pours out upon him all the fullness of parental love, in the one desire that he may do well, that he may be worthy of his cares, and his freely bestowed pains, that he may walk in the way of honor and happiness. In that way he cannot walk one step without virtue. Such is life, in its relationships. A thousand ties embrace it, like the fine nerves of a delicate organization, like the strings of an instrument capable of sweet melodies, but easily put out of tune or broken, by rudeness, anger, and selfish indulgence. If life could, by any process, be made insensible to pain and pleasure, if the human heart were hard as adamant, then avarice, ambition, and sensuality might channel out their paths in it, and make it their beaten way, and none would wonder or protest. If we could be patient under the load of a mere worldly life, if we could bear that burden as the beasts bear it, then, like beasts, we might bend all our thoughts to the earth, and no call from the great heavens above us would startle us from our plodding and earthly course. But we are not insensible brutes who can refuse the call of reason and conscience. The soul is capable of remorse. When the great dispensations of life press down upon us, we weep, and suffer and sorrow. And sorrow and agony desire other companionships than worldliness and irreligion. We are not willing to bear those burdens of the heart, fear, anxiety, disappointment, and trouble, without any object or use. We are not willing to suffer to be sick and afflicted, to have our days and months lost to comfort and joy, and overshadowed with calamity and grief, without advantage or compensation, to barter away the dearest treasures, the very sufferings, of the heart, to sell the life-blood from failing frame and fading cheek, our tears of bitterness and groans of anguish, for nothing. Human nature, frail, feeling, sensitive, and sorrowing, cannot bear to suffer for naught. Everywhere, human life is a great and solemn dispensation. Man, suffering, enjoying, loving, hating, hoping, and fearing, chained to the earth and yet exploring the far recesses of the universe, has the power to commune with God and his angels. Around this great action of existence the curtains of time are drawn, but there are openings through them which give us glimpses of eternity. God looks down upon this scene of human probation. The wise and the good in all ages have interposed for it with their teachings and their blood. Everything that exists around us, every movement in nature every counsel of providence, every interposition of God, centers upon one point, the fidelity of man. And even if the ghosts of the departed and remembered could come at midnight through the barred doors of our dwellings, and the shrouded dead should glide through the aisles of our churches and sit in our Masonic temples, their teachings would be no more eloquent and impressive than the great realities of life, than those memories of misspent years, those ghosts of departed opportunities, that, pointing to our conscience and eternity cry continually in our ears, work while the day lasts. For the night of death cometh, in which no man can work, there are no tokens of public mourning for the calamity of the soul. Men weep when the body dies, and when it is born to its last rest, they follow it with sad and mournful procession. But for the dying soul there is no open lamentation, for the lost soul there are no obsequies. And yet the mind and soul of man have a value which nothing else has. They are worth a care which nothing else is worth, and to the single, solitary individual. They ought to possess an interest which nothing else possesses. The store treasures of the heart, the unfathomable minds that are in the soul to be wrought, the broad and boundless realms of thought, the freighted argosy of man's hopes and best affections, are brighter than gold and dearer than treasure. And yet the mind is in reality little known or considered. 
It is all which man permanently is, his inward being, his divine energy, his immortal thought, his boundless capacity, his infinite aspiration, and nevertheless, few value it for what it is worth. Few see a brother mind in others, through the rags with which poverty has clothed it, beneath the crushing burdens of life, amidst the close pressure of worldly troubles, wants and sorrows. Few acknowledge and cheer it in that humble blot, and feel that the nobility of earth, and the commencing glory of heaven are there. Men do not feel the worth of their own souls. They are proud of their mental powers, but the intrinsic, inner, infinite worth of their own minds they do not perceive. The poor man, admitted to a palace, feels, lofty and immortal being as he is, like a mere ordinary thing amid the splendors that surround him. He sees the carriage of wealth roll by him, and forgets the intrinsic and eternal dignity of his own mind in a poor and degrading envy, and feels as an humbler creature, because others are above him, not in mind, but in mensuration. Men respect themselves, according as they are more wealthy, higher in rank or office, loftier in the world's opinion, able to command more votes, more the favorites of the people or of power. The difference among men is not so much in their nature and intrinsic power, as in the faculty of communication. Some have the capacity of uttering and embodying in words their thoughts. All men, more or less, feel those thoughts. The glory of genius and the rapture of virtue, when rightly revealed, are diffused and shared among unnumbered minds. When eloquence and poetry speak, when those glorious arts, statuary, painting, and music, take audible or visible shape, when patriotism, charity, and virtue speak with a thrilling potency, the hearts of thousands glow with a kindred joy and ecstasy. If it were not so, there would be no eloquence, for eloquence is that to which other hearts respond, it is the faculty and power of making other hearts respond. No one is so low or degraded, as not sometimes to be touched with the beauty of goodness. No heart is made of materials so common, or even base, as not sometimes to respond, through every chord of it, to the call of honor, patriotism, generosity, and virtue. The poor African slave will die for the master, or mistress, or in defense of the children, whom he loves. The poor, lost, scorned, abandoned, outcast woman will, without expectation of reward nurse those who are dying on every hand utter strangers to her, with a contagious and horrid pestilence. The pickpocket will scale burning walls to rescue child or woman, unknown to him, from the ravenous flames. Most glorious is this capacity. A power to commune with God and his angels, a reflection of the uncreated light, a mirror that can collect and concentrate upon itself all the moral splendors of the universe. It is the soul alone that gives any value to the things of this world and it is only by raising the soul to its just elevation above all other things, that we can look rightly upon the purposes of this earth. No scepter nor throne, nor structure of ages, nor broad empire, can compare with the wonders and grandeurs of a single thought. That alone, of all things that have been made, comprehends the maker of all. That alone is the key which unlocks all the treasures of the universe, the power that reigns over space, time and eternity. That, under God, is the sovereign dispenser to man of all the blessings and glories that lie within the compass of possession, or the range of possibility. Virtue, heaven, and immortality exist not, nor ever will exist for us except as they exist and will exist, in the perception, feeling, and thought of the glorious mind. My brother, in the hope that you have listened to and understood the instruction and lecture of this degree, and that you feel the dignity of your own nature and the vast capacities of your own soul for good or evil, I proceed briefly to communicate to you the remaining instruction of